is an undeformed domain with flatline strata. <laughs> we tested the previous hypothesis of gravity slumping with cross sections, and we found that it wasn't possible that this hypothesis could not be possible with a detachment in the Menard formation, but possibly with a lower detachment and some paleo slope there. And finally, the orientation of faults within the Wolf Creek fault zone suggests a component of right lateral strike slip displacement similar to the San Andreas fault on the St. Genevieve fault zone as it propagated to the southeast during Mississippian to early Pennsylvanian time. And that's all I have for today. Um, I would like to thank my advisors, Steve Marshak and Joe Rivera, for their patience, encouragement, and expertise. My colleagues, uh, John Nelson, Brett Denny, Jane Domeyer, and Eric Frey for many visits in the field, lunch, um, just a nice time. My fellow grad students, Deep Sen, Stephanie Major, Stephanie Domeroyes, and uh, many others of you who are here today for your support and also some really good times. Uh, generous funding by the Illinois State Geological Survey for all of this uh, work um, along by the USGS State Map Program and the Geology Department here uh, for their support through the Leighton Jackson Award. And my family, Casey, my mom, my dad, uh, my dad Humphrey, <laughs> <laughs> my grandparents who can't be here today, um, and my aunts and uncles and many other of you, housemates and whatnot, uh, for support. Thanks for being here, and I can take questions now. Can you show the map of your, with your three domains again? Sure. And you said something that I was wondering about. You had the, the I guess it would be the eastern domain. Uh huh. And you're suggesting that it had rotated. Yeah. In the position. Mm -hmm. Let me bring How up. How much one. rotation is required? And do you have evidence? I mean, how would you test that? Because it seems to me that the map doesn't really support the rotation. Let me bring that one up here. That kind of works, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm you know, as a petrologist, <laughs> not a structural geologist. I would, I, I'm sort of seeing this as, you know, think about rolled garnets in a in a nice, for example. You should see see trails of faults coming off that rotated block, if you will. And and I don't see it. And I'm just wondering what you would look for to test that. That's a, one of the questions I had. I mean, I saw this orientation and I thought that might be happening. Um, and I'm not sure exactly what we would look for for rotation. Uh, I was the way it looks to me is that there, it would require a significant amount of rotation, which would imply quite a bit of movement, a strike slip displacement right. on this St. Genevieve fault. And I don't know that this St. Genevieve fault underwent enough. Uh, lateral display, uh, enough lateral displacement to rotate these faults, um, and that's that's. I mean, well, then I guess another questions. question would be: it's an, it's it's definitely a negative flower structure, oh. right? Mm -hmm. So, in its orientation, is how well known is the trend of the St. Genevieve faults on both sides? Does it could it's possibly be a change in orientation of a major fault zone that could cause a change in orientation of a negative flower structure on side? I don't think so, just because. Because, so to answer your question, the trend of the St. Genevieve fault zone is tightly constrained by Devonian rocks, literally about right here, lower Mississippian rocks there, and then your upper Mississippian rocks here. So we have about 2,500 feet of displacement here, and the stratigraphic offset and its trend, along with bedding orientations along the zone, pretty much locked down that, uh, the, the location of the fault there. Um, but there's a slight bend, there's a slight bend in the fault as shown, I think it's the next, let's see, two slides ahead. 
Mary, before you switch that slide, I just have one thing. If you look at, at these faults in here, mm. you'll notice they're slightly sigmoidal. Right. It's kind of like rotated tension gashes. Okay. So that kind of gives you the sense of uh, that it's going to happen. Is there so enough? I mean, well, that's the thing. No yeah. But, but she's right. also near the end, near the splay, the end of the fault on both sides. Yeah. So that would indicate that it should die out in terms of less displacement mm -hmm. where towards that eastern zone also. So Probably. here sort of shows that there's there's yeah. a slight bend in the fault mm -hmm. right here to um, if we have right lateral displacement it would right lateral displacement of the zone in general we would get extensional fractures here and it's still one of my questions it's hard it's been really hard with these mid-continent faults if you don't have a piercing point like an offset paleo channel or something to constrain the amount of lateral displacement on these faults um, really good question I'll have to think a little bit more it's a for a PhD then on your uh, two domains are, are they are you saying that before they rotated the, the faulty was actually parallel in those two domains I don't think it was parallel I I think the, uh, the orientation of the faults in the western domain I'll bring that up here I think that the orientation of faults in this western domain <coughs> is the orientation that the ones in the eastern domain were formed in, and then through some rotation, the eastern domain, uh, the faults that become the eastern domain get rotated around, um, and these are older, these are newer. Um, so, wouldn't I think that these ones initially formed in this orientation. Yeah. Well, wouldn't you expect a lot of extension in the central domain then? If that thing ro rotated away, it's going to have to create a lot of space in there. Mm -hmm. I think that was accommodated. I, well, what I envision with, with sort of the trend, the fact that there's a western domain and an eastern domain here, I think what's actually happening is that there's, I think there's a fault spike coming off of the St. Genevieve underlying this this structural domain, and and that's the one that's accommodating the, and it's within these domains that the extension is accommodated. And for some reason, in the middle of that, they're unformed. I don't know why, but I envision the, this faulted structural domain and this one here, because the rocks become horizontal over here too. So I, I'm not sure exactly why, but I think it's a, a focused zone where the fault splay is off the St. Genevieve fault zone have concentrated the extension into these areas. And that might explain why we get why we get extension that we can really see surface offset within these areas. Because if it was distributed over a wide area, it would we would maybe see less displacement over each of those faults. Yeah, John? Did you observe any any of the faults in either of those domains deforming any unit older than the upper part of the Menard? Yeah, actually, um, we did a drill hole. We did a drill hole here um, that we observed the Menard tilted 10 to 15 degrees. And it was when I saw that that I thought we have deformation below the Menard, in the Menard and below. And we don't have cores deep enough, uh, deeper than the Menard, to see whether those units are faulted. But the fact that the Menard was tilted was my first indication that the Menard being flat lying throughout this whole area and all the rest of the blocks above it slumping down on it just didn't hold water. I'd like to be able to, well, drilling's expensive, but I'd like to be able to drill more to see, to see deeper because the surface exposures aren't such that we'd be able to see deeper in this area. The Menard is, is gray on that. Uh, this is grouped, some of the Menard is split out in purple here, the lower, the units below the Menard are in gray, and yeah, so there, there is some Menard here, but I grouped it together with the lower formations, um, just to illustrate the geometries here and here. However, in the, in the GG well, um, there was, everything was, uh, dipping except for Menard. Menard was flatlined, I believe. So how do you explain that? Right. Um, let me let me take us to the cross section. Okay. So I explain that by 
So here's the GG well mm -hmm. that Joe's talking about. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> what I envision is we have tilted, we observe tilted Kincaid, Dagonia, and Chlor. Mm -hmm. The Chlor is typically 80 to 90 feet thick. And here in the, core, in the core, it's only 40 feet thick. And then we get directly into flat-lying Menard. And so the way, I, in, the way I, I explain that is that we penetrated a normal fault, which explains both the dipping strata above um, and the thinning of the core formation there, and that we're penetrating the foot wall block of another, or we're penetrating a foot wall block that doesn't have tilted beds at that location. It's a little bit, the argument I agree is a little yeah. bit circumstantial, yeah. um, but given the limited data, it's the best that right. I could do with that. Okay, I understand. Yeah. Uh, Mary, what was your idea on the Mississippi River? He says following, is it just parallel to it, or is it actually underlying it there, or what's causing it to be straight and, and, sure. and shift there? Um, let me bring up just a regional <coughs> picture to show this. Um, and we can see in this one that that the Mississippi River flows flows a uh, southeast-ish and then it bends a little bit and flows pretty much along the trend of the St. Genevieve Fault Zone. And <coughs> the location that it trends parallel to the St. Genevieve Fault Zone is where the fault trace intersects with the um, with the modern river. So in this in this locality, the fault is uh, controlling the, the direction of the Mississippi River. But I just meant to show that in a more okay. regional sense. I don't really have any speculations, you know, about in detail. You didn't mean you didn't mean that whole stretch all the way up to Chester or all the way up to Bomar. I think there might be maybe some local effects, um, possibly by the dip off of the St. Genevieve Fault Zone. Because remember, the, the St. Genevieve forms the boundary between the Ozark Dome and the Illinois Basin, two huge co continental scale structures. And so um, I think a little bit of its direction near Chester over here may explain the trend of the river here, but not all the way up through that way, because yeah. here's just the full. Parallel strike of batting up there. Yeah. And, uh, I don't know where, where the river bends back to the north. Of all oh, that's that southeast stretch of the Mississippi parallels the strike of bedding, so it was probably influenced by bedrock. weak layers versus resistant bedrock layers. Yeah, because yeah, the, the dip toward the basin is to the northeast, and the strike of the beds is, is roughly northwest. Only a short part of it actually follows the fence uh, falls on. Uh -huh. yeah, Mary, the, uh, the, uh, just look at the length of the St. Genevieve Fault Zone. Uh, especially going into Missouri, there has, is there any evidence of these structures over in Missouri? Has anybody looked at those at, at the fault over in that area in any detail? They've actually their evidence for strikes of faulting is exposed okay. is is exposed right about here um, in the uh, near the town of St. Genevieve, for which the fault zone is named, and I haven't come across anything showing negative.